So we're going to do this a little bit different today, meaning that we're part of our presentation today is going to be done via uh, a PowerPoint presentation like we've done with you in the past. And then we also will be um, turning that off so that we can share the screen with our presenters. So you'll see a little bit of um, some changes on the screen. And I just tell you that in advance because I want you to know it's not you. We planned it that way. The other thing that we'll have in our presentation today is we're going to have some polls. Uh, we tried that last time and that was a lot of fun. So we're going to give you an opportunity to have some input into the presentation. But briefly, here's our team. Uh, we're the Sullivan team. I'm Ingrid Sullivan, uh, John Sullivan, and Debbie Ford. Debbie's on with me today. Debbie is a huge help. She orchestrates a lot of our Zooms, uh, puts our slideshows together, just a great right arm. And uh, on her right here on the team, on excuse me, on this page is uh, Patrick Sullivan. Uh, he's our son. Uh, Patrick has joined us. He's a realtor now, at, like John and I are, and he's also our client care manager. So just making sure that for any of you that are new to our, uh, our program today and you're unaware, Sullivan and Sullivan Real Estate Team uh, is the owner of Senior Downsizing Experts which is our move management company that also is aligned with a lot of the partners that you've met this year. But we started out as real estate agents and saw that we had a dire need for more uh, help in our business. So we built senior downsizing experts. So let's get started. Here's our first poll. What we'd like to ask today's um, seminar is called Be Smart About Leaving a Legacy. And Debbie's going to give us an opportunity here for you to check what your definition is of leaving a legacy. Let's do that, Debbie, and see what they think. Being fondly remembered, wealth left to heirs, family traditions, accomplishments. Everybody mark what you feel is important. And Debbie, I forgot to ask you, can they do more than one or is it just one? I believe this one's multiple choice. So. Okay. All right. So we ready to wrap it up? Let's see what we got. All right. Looks like being fondly remembered is a big one for everybody. And then we have wealth left to heirs. And then we go down from there, family traditions and accomplishments. Okay. Well, let's see what the what another definition is. We looked up a couple of de definitions for us today. Um, dictionary definition, the amount of money or property left to someone in a will. Reminds us of death, but it's really not about death. It's about more than finances. It's something about you that lives on beyond your life. So where I'd like to start with that, to kind of prep us for our talk today, I'd like to start by um, telling, uh, uh, I've got three stories I wanna share with you. And they're all referencing leaving a legacy in different ways. The first one that I have, I had a little friend, her name was Iris, sweet, sweet lady. Um, I helped her, she went to church with me. I helped her uh, sell her home. Uh, when she made the decision that she really wanted to move into a retirement community, uh, she was stricken with COPD and it was just easier for her to have less to manage uh, with the house when she made her move. Um, one day when I was going into, into church, I was walking through and she was sitting in the fellowship hall and she pulled me aside and she said, Ingrid, when something happens to me, I'd really like you to manage my final affairs. Would you consider that? And I was a little bit stunned by that, but I was flattered that she asked me. And I said, Iris, I would do anything for you. And of course, I'm going to help you with that. But you've got a long ways. Well, lo and behold, five months later, Iris passed. And I was at that point called to help with her funeral arrangements. 
one of the things that she had shared with me when she was just a, a week before her death, she had me come over early in the morning and she said, I need you to go into the closet. There's going to be a green box in there and I have a green folder in there as well. Get that out and bring that to me. And in that green folder was a green wood folder. And um, she said, I need you to take this over to this funeral home and they'll help you with everything that I've asked for. Well, she had already paid for all of her arrangements. And when I got to the funeral home, all I really needed to worry about was picking the flowers that we would have um, during the memorial time uh, for people, the visitation for people to come. And she was very specific with me about finding the right color of granite for her um, grave marker. And she sent me to Cleburne so that I could make sure and find the right color to mat match with the family plot. Well, the retirement community that she was living in had already rented her apartment out, I mean, right away. And she needed to get her things out of there, which was very stressful because she had taken, come from a 2,400 square feet home and moved into a one bedroom apartment and brought a lot of things with her. The retirement community allowed us to pack everything up and move into a vacant apartment that they didn't have rented. And we started the process. I went through the things. I looked at her will and I started um, uh, working with the things that she had identified in her will. You see, she had one son that lived in another state and they were estranged. They didn't have any communication with each other. And she also had two grandchildren that were estranged. And my task was to distribute the china and the silver coins amongst the grandchildren and send all of the photos to the son. He didn't want any of those things, but I didn't want to take on the responsibility of destroying all of those old photos that obviously there was a lot of memories there. We had the estate sale inside of the retirement community because they wouldn't allow any outsiders to come in. And I was very worried that, you know, we weren't going to get rid of anything, but lo and behold, just about everything sold. And what I was left with is uh, donating the rest. And I donated the majority of the things that were left to a place called Barry Goodbyes in Fort Worth. But her having that plan together really helped me expedite those things in a way that she would have wanted me to do that. I had another client that I had um, worked with and actually I was I go to church with him as well. He and I were on the board of directors together and I had sold two homes for him and he had was living in one that he had built just a year prior. And he also decided because they didn't like the fact that it was a two-story home, they were they had built another one. He had a sudden death, a massive heart attack. They'd only been in their new home about a week and a half with all the boxes still in place, uh, not even unpacked yet. Their kids lived in other states. This was Mr. and Mrs. Greenslade. Their kids lived in other states. One of the uh, children, the son, was um, uh, designated as the executor and the oldest daughter was designated as the trustee. Mrs. Greenslade was challenged with memory problems soon to be getting much worse. They had a trust in place and they had taken the time the week before they were moving into the new house to update all of their paperwork, all their legal paperwork, their wills, power of attorneys, everything. The family came and took everything that they wanted out of the house and took mom with them. And I was left to donate the rest and sell those two homes. The first home sold relatively soon the second home was at the beginning of COVID when in my business, real estate, it was when people really weren't getting out much and they didn't want to do much at all with respect to real estate. We took some amazing pictures, did a walkthrough tour as if you would be side by side with me. And we sold that house sight unseen and sent the proceeds to the family. Here's my third story. My third story 
is my family. My mother's been gone almost two years. They lived in another state as well, in New Mexico. My mom and stepdad created a, uh, a will with a, comp with a company that they found on the internet. There was no real discussion with my siblings and I, I have three siblings, about their plans. One of my sisters was promised their property and three of us were left out. A family meeting was called. The promised property changed and we all decided that once mom was gone that we were going to sell that property. The distance between Texas and New Mexico made it hard for me and my other siblings also lived in other states. I was the only person in our family that really kind of had the knowledge of what the process is uh, because of the business that we do. So I was called upon to liquidate the uh, property and interview realtors to get it sold. We fought over the leftover belongings because there were certain things that were designated, but there was so much that wasn't discussed. And today, my siblings and I seldom converse with each other because of the stress that we all went through with the liquidation. And we're all working to try to bring ourselves back together again. But mom was such an integral part of our lives, and now she's not there to ask those things any longer. There wasn't much planning in that situation, although there was in the two prior. Debbie, I'm ready for another poll. For you, audience, have you ever been involved in planning a funeral or finalizing the estate of a loved one? Okay. So it looks like we have... The majority of our audience has said yes to that. And we have one person in our audience that has said no. So what that leads us to is our first guest panelist today. We're gonna to be moving forward and we're gonna be talking about how do I wanna be remembered? And our panelist today is Bertha Hurls We've uh, talked with her before in our presentations. She's actually going to talk to us today about the importance of how to be remembered. And the topics that you see on the screen are the things that Bertha said would be important for us to discuss. So she's briefly gonna go over the importance of planning, as you heard from the examples that I shared with you earlier, how important that is. How do I know if it's the best time to start planning for my funeral? my creation and or cemetery property? And who should I choose to be in charge of my arrangements? Bertha, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can actually be focused on you to share these topics with us. Thanks for coming today. Mm -hmm. Well, hello everyone. My name is Bertha Hurls and I hold the license with the state of Texas and I plan funerals, cremation and cemetery property. And I am with Dignity Memorial. Some of you may have heard of Dignity Memorial. Um, we have 33 locations in this area, which is some of the locations um, this, in Dallas, which is Dallas, Laurelland, Fort Worth, the Laurelands, Blue Bonnet Hills, J.E. Files, Sparkman Hillcrest, so many. So what I want to talk to you about right now is how do you want to be remembered. You know, Ingrid brought up some really interesting stories. And the stories are where someone needs someone to help them at one point. You know, I've been in this business many, many years, and I have helped hundreds of families, but I also know that they have been many conflicts and one thing Ingrid brought up is when uh, she said Iris wanted her to be the one to help her. Well, you know, that is so important because one thing about it, you want to make sure that you have 
someone you can count on. You know, and I understand, you know, we have families and we'll, we'll say, oh, my children will take care of it or my surviving spouse will take care of it, which is fine. But sometimes it doesn't always happen like that. So one of the things about being remembered you want to think about, again, is doing cremation. Cremation is really on a rise right now. And a lot of people want to be cremated. A lot of people want to be scattered. But you have to realize when you ask someone to scatter your cremated remains, they're probably going to say, oh, yes, if I'm around, yes. But we have so many people, once a death occur, that person isn't able to scatter for whatever reason. Sometimes maybe they're older, maybe they just can't wrap their heads around being able to scatter. So things like that, you have to be very, very sure that whoever you put in charge will be able to execute whatever you have. Because remember, with Iris, um, Ingrid had to execute what she wanted. And Ingrid wanted to make sure that she did it. But sometimes these things can stretch out and they can be enormous when it comes to closing accounts selling items, taking care. So when you tell someone you want, you'll do that, it's not just black and white all the time. So I just want you to think about that. And with that remembrance, you want to make sure um, that so many, there's so many reasons why someone, looking at my notes, so many reasons why someone would be thinking about their legacy. Because number one, you want your legacy to be how you want it. You don't want someone else to say, oh, well, I think um, Miss Mary would have wanted this, or I think Mr. John would have wanted this. Leave instructions. Instructions where someone can just execute what you want. Very, very important. Another thing that's so important when it comes to when Ingrid said she, uh, Iris wanted her to get the right color marker. If someone leaves you in charge and you don't have a footprint, then you are responsible for going to that funeral home, choosing markers, choosing colors. What am I going to place on the marker? What would Ms. Brown like on her marker? So it, it can be very, very daunting for some people. And I've seen where some people go, no, no, I, 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 I had no idea I was getting into this. I, I just can't handle it. So you want to make sure with your legacy that you don't put someone in that situation where they won't be able to execute. So really, really think about that. You know, a lot of times, we think, oh, well, I should really take care of my own services. But for whatever reason, sometimes people want to put that on someone else. And sometimes it's just not fair. But, but you know, people do it. So I just want you guys to really understand the importance of taking care of your legacy, writing things down, because you don't want family conflict. Because remember, when Ingrid um, asked Iris' son, you know, let me send you this, he didn't want any of it. So that puts, again, you in a situation where, you know, if they don't want this, what am I going to do with it? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of things that happen. So that's why I just encourage people to really Think about your legacy. Think about how you want to be remembered. Think about your loved ones. And perhaps you want to take care of that yourself. And if not, just make sure that whomever you have chosen that responsibility to, that they will be able to execute. If you're going to do that, I always say you need at least two or three people. Don't have just one, because what if that person passes on before you? Mm -hmm. So those type of things, really be cognizant and really think about what you are doing and what you're leaving behind. Yeah. 
Bertha, I was going to just add something, um, which I'm, I think for you this year probably has been, you know, we've all, we all say now, oh, 2020, it's been a year, but you know, no, there's no time like the moment for us. Cause remember COVID, how many of us there, there, that's an unplanned thing. Um, you know, Pat had said earlier, she didn't even know she was COVID positive and she was tested COVID positive. So if you haven't done anything, this is a good time to be thinking about that. I think Bertha would agree and a good time to start writing down what would that be like in the event that something like that happened to leave. Um, I like to say this and I know it sounds kind of awkward, but it's the best way I can say it. Leave the gift of grieving to your family, not the gift of, oh my gosh, I can't believe they had this, or I can't believe they didn't attend to that. Um, give your family an opportunity to sit back and appreciate you and remember you and all those things that you absolutely want because you did take the time to, if nothing else, write down instructions for them on, this is what I'd like to see. It makes a huge difference. Would you yes, agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, oh, go ahead, Ingrid. You wanted no, to say. Okay. Also, I wanted to talk to you about how do I know when this is the right time to pre plan my funeral or my cremation or cemetery property? You know, that's one thing that over the years, and as long as I've been in this business, that's one thing that people always say, well, Bertha, I don't, I, I'm just not ready, or I, I don't know. But you know, that's something we're really never really ready to do that. We're really never ready to walk into a funeral home and make plans or, you know, walk into a cemetery and try to pick property. It's, it's just no, I tell people all the time, it's just no right time. But what I can say about that is people who choose to just bite the bullet and get the information, they feel so much better. And I'm going to ask Ingrid a question on this. Okay. Because I know that when Ingrid and John pre-planned with me, it probably wasn't, you know, a subject where they was like, oh, let's just go see Bertha. Let's just go play in our services. But why did you do it? Why was the time right for you and John? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I, I have an answer that might not be the answer that you, that you're expecting, <laughs> but my answer is this. I feel like if I'm gonna talk about something, you need to put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> and I wanna make sure that if I'm, if I'm sharing information with people that I'm coming from knowing and we had been through uh, a couple of situations with my parents and uh, with Iris, that was uh, Iris, uh, before the Green Slades. And John and I just said, you know what, we want to make sure that that's not going to happen to Patrick. We want to make sure that he's taken care of and that he knows exactly what we want to do. And we were surprised. We actually had a lot of fun sitting down with her and doing it. It wasn't what anybody would think of, oh my gosh, this is going to be horrible. Um, it was comforting and relieving to know that it's all done. Yeah. So another thing I want you to think about when it comes to actually understanding if you're ready, I want you to really think about this and really ask yourself, if you were put in a situation and you lost a loved one, would you be prepared to plan the service, to go out and choose a casket, to choose an urn, to walk through a cemetery and choose the property? Do you want to do that for someone else? You know, so really think about that. Oh, am I really ready to do this? Do I want to put that on someone else? Or... Would it be better if I just bite the bullet and just go and take care of my plans so that when something happens, my family can really gather together and they can just be there for one another and there's no bickering. Yeah. I, you know, that's the biggest that's thing. There is so much family conflict. I have worked with some families throughout the years and they've never spoken again which is really, really sad. 
And one family comes to mind. I was working with this family probably about seven years ago. And I was sitting in there um, with, with, in the arrangements and nothing was done. And they had three children. The dad had already passed years ago. His military passed years ago, but the mom was still there. They hadn't pre-planned anything. But I knew the family, so I, I was with the family. They wanted me to be in there. And it was just so sad because of the fact that the three children were there. Their mom had passed away. Now, you could tell that in that room, things had been bubbling up. You know, they brought up things that happened 20 years ago. And the bottom line was this, and I never forget, they had two girls and a son. So they were planning everything, getting everything going. And then at the end, of course, the funeral director is going to tally up and give them the bill. So, and, and I just knew, I was like, oh, this is not going to be good. It's not going to be good in my mind. So the son, I guess, had been a little estranged and that sort of thing. So one of the girls told the funeral director, split it three ways. The funeral director did and said what they had to. And I just saw that guy, he just melted because there was no way he could come up with that. And then the other sister, it's just like it was a knife just going in. It's like, you never have money. I know he doesn't have any money. And it was just, it was just so horrible. And, and at that point I was like, I was embarrassed for him and he was embarrassed. And then I was looking at the sisters going, oh, I know your mother would not like this. Mm -hmm. So I've seen so many of these uncomfortable situations. On the other hand, I've seen it where people have pre-planned. There was no conflict because you know why? Everything was in line. So there was nothing to fight about. The only thing you needed to do was give the, direct, the funeral director a time and a day that you wanted to execute your parent or whomever it was, their service. So I, I could go on and on with several, several stories about conflict. So that is just something that I really want you to know that planning, getting information is the best gift you can give your loved ones. That's great. That's great. Thank you, mm -hmm. Bertha. I You're appreciate welcome. that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. All right. We are going to, um, let me make a quick change here. Oops. Debbie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My screen isn't looking like it's supposed to look. <laughs> okay. So what we have next um, after, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we're back to our presentation. No, yes. we're, seeing your, we're seeing your desktop right now. Oh my goodness. I, I will admit it's a beautiful scene. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes me feel a whole lot better. I appreciate that. How about now? Uh, I like the other scene better. It's just a white screen right now. <laughs> oh, no. oh, here we go. We're back. Okay. Thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness. All right. Here you go. We planned and planned and planned. You know, never assume it's going to be perfect. But uh, before we go into our next sec section here, we, so we've talked about what is a legacy. We've talked about planning a legacy. And now we have leaving a legacy. Our next uh, speaker is uh, a gentleman by the name of Ken Wimberly. And Ken is a businessman, actually a business associate of mine. 
Uh, he is a commercial real estate broker, very successful person in Fort Worth. And he for years has been wanting to create an application that would allow people to leave a legacy in the way of stories and movies and pictures for their family. So this, uh, he's going to talk to us about an application called Legacy of Love. And he was kind enough to offer up two subscriptions, $99 subscriptions for us to give away today at the end of our presentation. Uh, Debbie, what do we need to do next to go to that? Um, if you'll stop your share, I'll share mine and play the okay. video. Okay. So give me just a second. All right, do you see the Legacy of Love screen? Yep. Okay. So, uh, Kim, thanks for so much for joining us today. We're really excited that you um, had time to share uh, your application with us because I think our audience is really going to enjoy having an opportunity of sharing their lives uh, as they're leaving a legacy for their family. So tell us a little bit about this. And so we know it better knowing that at the end of our seminar today, uh, Ken was kind en enough to uh, share uh, a couple of prescriptions or subscriptions for yeah. this application. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Ingrid. Appreciate it. So Legacy of Love is, is a person-to-person -person journaling app. It's designed to be the easy button to capture moments, save memories, pass on legacies that you want to be there for generations and generations to come. Um, I used it or I created it initially for me as a father for a way to pass down moments, memories, and lessons to my children. Um, I have many, many parents that are using this and now many grandparents that are using this um, for two reasons. One, as a grandparent, would be to write stories to their children or their grandchildren <laughs> about their grandchildren, about what they love about them, about the way that they have uh, kind of lit up their day and, and made things better. And then also, though, as a way to tell their own story. There's so many people that uh, when they lose their parents, the one thing they wish they had most was some more time to get the history and the family stories from their loved ones. And so what folks have been able to do now is to use our app to tell those stories, either in written format for people that want to write down the stories or in video format, which is great. You just pop open a video, record the video, um, speak into the camera and speak your words with your, with your, your, um, uh, your video or audio. It's great. We can record audio. And then you can also, if you're telling a particular story on a timeline, you can backdate the entries in mm. our system right here. So that if you're telling a story from, you know, 1995, you kind of backdate that entry to 1995. <laughs> and it's kind of really neat because what our system will, will be able to do is to, um, if you set up your account with your date of birth in there, and you back get an entry, the system will say, oh, wow, you were you know, 47 years old at the time of this entry, or wow. 56 years old at the time of this entry, and you can create a, little, a digital timeline of your life. And I've done that to create a digital timeline of my child's life. And I'll quickly, I'll just show you a quick demo of the, uh, of the app. Tell me if you can see this. Yes. Great. So this is, is what our app is. It's Legacy of Love. And again, so this is a little icon on Legacy of Love. Click on that. Pulls up my feed right here. Let me show you a quick demo of the timeline feature. As I was mentioning, I'm going to filter this by, oops, so filter by my um, youngest son, Kai. I had multiple family members in here. I'm going to filter by my youngest son and apply that. You again, oops, sorry, go into milestones. Um, okay, so this is, um, now I'm doing a digital, I'm just clicking on the milestones here. This is a digital timeline. You can see kind of by date here of all of the major milestones of my youngest son's life. I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning. He's only five years old, so it doesn't take too long to go back to the beginning, which is his sonogram. Um, and then from oh. there, to the, and you can see all the, the different dates on here. Yeah. The day he was born, rolled over, first word, starts crawling, 
all the way up into his, uh, you know, uh, a sort of pre-K. So one can do this with their family members, or one can do this with themselves, telling stories about your life, and it'll create the digital timeline on the story of one's life right there. So, um, and then for for any of your guests, um, anyone that wins this. Uh, these prizes, I'm happy to do a personal demo for them and That'd give them a personal walkthrough on some best practices on how to use it and, and how to perhaps journal to your children and grandchildren. That is really great. And especially, you know, based on 2020 <laughs> and what's been going on this year, uh, how relative is that? That's really great. There's a lot to write about. And, you know, in years down the road, and let's, let's hope it's not too clear to us everything we remember from 2020. So I've been spending a lot of time writing to my children just about the weirdness that's gone on this year and about how certain things just don't make any sense and it's the world we're in. So I hope my grandchildren will one day read that and just be baffled by the, uh, the world we're living in. Uh, quick question for you. So as they're recording this, um, you know, my I lost my mother a couple of years ago. And uh, we have five CDs that were recorded of her telling about her life. Yeah. I don't have a DVD player anymore, so I have to have a device to do that. How, um, what's the life of something like this? How does somebody use that? Yeah, these can be played um, certainly from the app. The videos can be played directly from the app onto a phone. We are currently working on an export feature that will roll out sometime first half of next year, okay, so that um, someone can export from our app onto like a standalone web page or blog page. Okay. So then they could just share the link to that with various family members on there and anyone could go view it from that page. And the final thing that we're working on is to be able to export to a book format. And here's the neat thing. There's technology right now that w even with a book, if someone recorded a bunch of videos, we can put something to the equivalent of a QR code, which I was familiar with right now, because it's how we have to look at our menus when we go into restaurants. Right. Uh, but you can put something along the equivalence of a QR code, hold your phone over the page of the book, and the video will play on your phone. Oh, that's great. I love it. So, that's yeah, a, a few different ways to kind of utilize the, the ultimate product. That's great. Well, we're really excited to share that with our audience and thank you so much for being so gracious and doing that with us. And we'll make sure and include uh, your uh, information so that they can set up, I'm sure they will want to set up a, a private time with you to get this going. That'd be great. Look forward to it. Thanks so much, Ingrid. Okay. Let me get back to my meeting controls. Hold on just a second. All right. Okay, so let me go back now. Can you see my screen now? Are we there? Okay. Just seeing your notes screen instead of the um, presentation screen. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. All right, good. So where we're going to go from here then uh, with Ken's app, and I really do encourage you, I can tell you that um, he is a very great guy to work with. And for whoever wins uh, the application, he's very good about uh, helping and sharing how to use that app. So you'll really enjoy that. So coming on to the next section of our presentation today, now we're going to talk about protecting your legacy. And, uh, you know, based on all the different things that we've discussed today, uh, including the things that uh, Bertha has shared with us uh, and the stories that I shared with you uh, and COVID that we are dealing with right now, I think there's so, it's really important that we take a look at how to protect our legacy. And our speaker for that section is going to be Matt Davidson. And Matt is with Davidson Law. Um, he is going to come on and he's going to talk to us about things like how does affording long-term care fit into preserving one's legacy? Uh, what's the definition of a trustee, an executor, and a beneficiary? Remember, I talked about having a trustee and an executor. 
what are the different types of power powers of attorney and how are they used and what are some of the important things to consider when appointing someone as an executor or power of attorney to your estate uh, and i'm going to stop sharing my uh, powerpoint and turn it over to matt hello everybody there you go awesome thank you ingrid thank you for having me uh, on this panel. I, I know a few of you, others I don't, um, but for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Matt Davidson. My brother and I run um, our law firm, which is an estate planning, elder law, and probate law firm. So you could say that we're in the business of protecting legacy. I mean, mm -hmm. so much so our, our website is yourtexaslegacy.com. Um, so this is right up our alley. Um, what I do crosses over a lot with what the other speakers talked about. Um, and so I'll just hit kind of how that works from an estate planning perspective and everything that you need to do from an estate planning and elder law perspective to help protect your legacy for the rest of your family. So uh, I will hit it while it's fresh. Ingrid did talk about a real estate transaction that she did where there was one of the adult children of the person who owned the home who was appointed as trustee of their parents' living trust. And so it's actually a perfect opportunity to talk about legacy and how living trusts work versus wills work. Um, at the very least, to protect your legacy, I recommend that at the very least, everybody have a will. Um, because if somebody does not have a will, then the laws of the state of Texas control where that money goes and how that money goes to people. Um, and you can't put any of your values around the money, which we'll talk about in a second. So a will at least enables you to pass money with your values, um, stewarding it to other family members, usually children. Um, <clears throat> so having a will at least enables you to, to, to do that in the way that you want to do, to protect your legacy in the way that you want to. Um, but some people choose to do living trusts um, in addition to wills um, simply because it does give you some added protection for your legacy. And one of the, the, the easiest ways to talk about it is what Ingrid experienced with that home is the, the streamlined effect and the efficiency that occurs uh, when one has a living trust and then passes away. As a lot of you probably know, if you have a will, you've at least accomplished um, telling the world how you want your legacy to be. However, with a will, there's usually a pretty large lag time between whenever somebody passes away and whenever that legacy is secured. You have to wait for the court, you have to wait for the judge, you have to wait for an executor to be appointed, etc. But whenever one has a living trust and has a trustee in place, you, the trustee can immediately have authority to act on behalf of the estate and the legacy. And that's why Ingrid was able to immediately list the home, get it ready to sell, and then have a quick closing um, ensuring that there is money in the estate without having to wait on the will, wait on the judge, wait on everything to be frozen. So having a living trust definitely helps with the efficiency of your legacy. And anytime that there's efficiency, all business owners understand this, that also saves you money, right? So that's a way of protecting the legacy, stewarding everything that you've worked hard for um, whenever you pass away. Now, some other components of a living trust that help me help my clients protect their legacy is this one circumstance that I see quite often, which is a married couple, one spouse passes away, the other spouse gets remarried, and then all of a sudden there's a new player in the legacy that's not the deceased spouse, and sometimes they cut out the kids, right? So th this poor person passed away, and because of the actions of, of their spouse after they passed away, their legacy is detoured away from their children. And so we do have protections in our living trust as well to help um, make it where the kids will still get a legacy regardless of the decisions that are made by a surviving spouse after one spouse passes away. And then also protecting the legacy has to do with protecting kids from themselves, right? Um, a lot of times, um, children are too young to receive a financial legacy, a financial inheritance. And so we have to put ages in place of when children can have access to the money, and that protects them from themselves. Um, we also 
put in behavioral guidelines, right? These are the behaviors we want to see. This is my values legacy. These were the values I lived by. Now these are the values I wanna see you live by my children before you can receive additional funds from my financial legacy. Uh, and then also protecting children from their creditors. If they were to get into financial trouble and have to file for bankruptcy, or if they were to get divorced, uh, or if they were to get sued, making sure that they're not going to lose all of the financial legacy that you left them if they are in one of those difficult financial spots. So that's, that's some ways that a living trust can help protect a legacy even more than a will can, but a will still protects it because we're at least taking it out of the hands of the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And so those are the main financial passing docs, but your legacy has more to do more than just to do with finances. It also has to do with how you spend your final days, how easy you made things for your family, where Bertha and I cross over, um, how you prepared um, for your funeral, for your memorial, for your burial, um, making that as easy as possible on your family so that they can just grieve. And all of that crosses over in estate planning as well, um, in, including doing durable powers of attorney and medical powers of attorney, making it where if in your final days you uh, don't have the ability to make decisions for yourself, making it as smooth and easy on your family as possible, uh, doing an advanced medical directive, making it where you don't put your children in a position where they have to live the rest of their life wondering if they make the right decision about life support, different issues like that, making your wishes clear in those particular medical areas. And then crossing over with Bertha, how she talked about how you need to, to really have successors of people that you've put in charge of your memorial instructions. Um, there is actually a document that we do that is even in addition to what Bertha does that was created by the Texas Health and Safety Code that gives people explicit authority to be able to deal with the funeral home, to deal with dignity, to deal with cemeteries, um, and has a place for you to clearly lay out, I have done this plan with Bertha. Here's what it looks like. Here's another spot where I'm writing it down to make sure that everybody is clear about, about what we're doing. So it would be in Bertha's documents as well as in estate planning documents. Um, now, Ingrid wanted me to talk a little bit about what's important whenever you're putting people into these different positions and what these different positions actually mean. Um, the first position that you would be asking a loved one to serve in would be your trustee if you have a living trust. And this would be the person who would handle your trust financial assets if you were incapacitated or if, if after you've passed, they need to handle the estate. The executor is only in a will. And so you name an executor in a will and then the judge approves the will if it's valid and then appoints the executor to serve. So the executor is one where there is a lag. Um, and then the powers of attorney, including for memorial and burial, um, are fiduciary positions. You put these people in these positions, they have a duty to you to do the best thing for you, what you've asked them to do. And then a beneficiary is simply a person in a will or a trust who receives something that you're giving them. Now, a lot of people, when they meet with me, they think that they need to pick their, their CPA uncle or their you know, uh, financial advisor cousin to be in these positions. That's, that's well and good and that's fine and a knowledge of financial things does help. But really the most important attribute of putting somebody into these trusted positions is being trustworthy. Because there are a lot of professionals around like me, like CPAs, like financial advisors whom people can hire to help them. But you really first just have to make sure that they're going to do the right thing for you that they're going to take care of things the way that Ingrid really took it seriously um, of taking care of a virus. Um, so really making sure that you have the right people in those positions and making your wishes explicitly clear all the way from assets to medical things to memorial. Now, it's funny that we've heard multiple stories about the, the personal property, the pots and the pans and the furniture and the jewelry. Um, honestly, in my business, whenever I'm probating wills or administering trust, um, that's the stuff that a lot of people fight over the most. Um, it, it, a lot of times it's not the big valuable assets. So the other day it was dad's jeans. 
um, that I had two sisters fighting over. So another document that we do as well is called a personal property memorandum, where you can actually write down in your own handwriting individual items that you want to go to individual people, just so it's very clear where you want my wedding ring to go, where I want my guns to go, where, where I want each of these individual things in addition to any real estate or cash that I might be leaving to my family. So we take that document very seriously. And then finally, as Ingrid said, a big part of estate planning these days with um, the largest percentage of people over 65 in United States history um, and statistics saying that each of them will spend an average of four years in long-term care and the rising cost where now some places it's over $10,000 a month. Um, it's become an important part for us to tackle in our firm because our job is to help clients to protect their assets for themselves, first of all, and then second for the next generation. And if all of your money gets drained and goes to long-term care, that really puts a hamper on what we're trying to do. So we've really taken it seriously as part of our practice to come up with some estate planning and elder law solutions to make it where if a client does have to go into long-term care, that every penny that they've worked so hard to earn is not drained and that there is something left for them whenever they pass, but most importantly, that they don't run out of money for themselves uh, while they're still living. So this is something that's become built into my practice in addition to the more traditional stuff that I've already articulated. Um, this is the new way that we're helping clients protect their legacy is by doing particular estate planning and elder law planning around long-term care. And this, this comes in many different forms, including certain types of trusts that are long-term care particular trusts, as well as some of you may have heard of a ladybird deed, which this is a particular document that helps to protect just the family home, particularly the family home, if one needs to go into long-term care. Mm -hmm. So my job is to protect legacy every, everywhere from values to money, to medical, to memorial, mm -hmm. to long-term care. We try to hit the whole gamut whenever we're helping our clients protect their legacy. That's great, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, keep this in mind, uh, audience, that uh, Matt's going to be around to answer uh, questions as well when we go forward. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, you know that uh, sure. we're going to take time to do that. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. All right, so we have discussed uh, protecting your legacy. And uh, now we want to go ahead. And of course, because I'm doing so much switching around here, I need my partner in crime, Debbie, to make sure I'm on the right screen for y'all. You are. I can see All you. All right. <laughs> That's important. Now we want to talk about preserving your legacy. So kind of as a reminder again, what have we done here? What is a legacy? Planning a legacy. Leaving a legacy. Protecting your legacy. Now we're talking about preserving your legacy and building wealth through an option of your real estate. So uh, here we're going to talk about risk versus returns, banks, stocks, real estate. We're going to talk about a new topic that we are uh, will be introducing more next year, uh, 1031 Exchange. So let's take a look at this screen that I have here for you. You know, when we look at uh, what some of our options are, and of course we know there's numerous options out there, but we could put our money in our bank account and let it sit there and earn 2% interest, if that, in some cases. Um, we may have CDs, we may have bonds, and of course, of course, those are directed during certain times when maybe the stock market is not at its best. But overall, the banks, that's going to be a low return for us. Then we have the stock market. And of course, that's really something. You're either really good at the stock market uh, or you are not and you have somebody else that's managing it for you. But what we see there is that the stock market can be a high risk. Uh, and it can also have a high return. I will say that um, this year's been, you've seen it raise and lower and then jump back up again. And for my parents, 
in 2008, when we had the real estate market crash, um, they had the majority of their retirement in stocks and they lost a significant amount of money at that time, leaving them their property and their social security to live out the rest of their lives uh, because they didn't plan very well. We also have another choice on here that's called real estate. And there we're looking at, <coughs> excuse me, low risk and high return. And we say that because, especially where we are right now in the state of Texas, the real estate market has been very stable and it continues to climb. You notice that with your property taxes. Um, this is just a brief uh, uh, description of that. Uh, there's a gentleman that's an economist that comes and speaks to us every fall about what's going on in the market, not just the real estate market, but in general, what's going on, uh, investments, et cetera, and what we can expect for next year. And these numbers are a, uh, this is a 10 year look at what's happened in the real estate market for us. And I've picked Arlington, Dallas, and Fort Worth. And what you see there by that graphic is that it's up, 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 up. There's a few dips, but not really anything there that is significant. And that's since 2010, moving up when we were in that recovery period. Right now, the projection is that interest rates will stay at 3%, uh, that they won't go higher, they could go lower, and that the real estate market, especially here in Texas, because we have lots of people moving in, is gonna continue to stay strong. Uh, so that should be comforting for those of you that are kind of in that place trying to decide, what does that look like for me going forward? I'd like to introduce a new idea to you today uh, some of you may have this already, but I'd like to talk to you about the benefit of a what they call a 1031 exchange. And what's so great about that product is it helps to build generational wealth. So just for you and for your family, you can build equity with a 1031 exchange, and there are tax benefits when it comes to the sale of a real estate property and capital gains. And I've put together just a few examples for you here to kind of see how that might work to give that some thought. So a 1031 exchange, the definition of that is it gets its name from the uh, section, the IRS Internal Revenue Code section called 1031. But what it does is it allows you to sell a piece of property and avoid paying capital gains taxes if it's over the allotted amount. So what that means to you is that if it's a couple that's living in a home and it sells, they are both tax-free on $500,000, anything $500,000 and under. If it is a single person living in a home, then when you sell your home, the first $250,000 is tax-free from capital gains taxes. Now, a way to reinvest your money, again, to avoid that um, capital gains, might be to consider to reinvest the money you made on the sale of your home on another property or properties like kind and equal or greater value. So a thought there would be, I have a home that's too large for me. I'd like to get into something smaller and I'm interested in purchasing investment property to help sustain, sustain me while I live in a retirement community or a smaller home, as an example. And I've put together an example for you to kind of demonstrate that visually so you can see how that might work. So what we see here is in my example, dad has passed and mom is moving to a senior retirement community for an easier life. We like to call that lock and leave, not having to worry about the, the roof and the hot water heater and the foundation and all of those things that go with homeownership. 
she has three children to help her make that move and go through that process. Mom has their inheritance to consider because she's selling a home that's $600,000. And based on the real estate market today, she sells that home at full price. So what she wants to do to secure her investment long-term is she is going to purchase three properties because she has three children. So she's also creating a future inheritance for them. This way, mom is selling her $600,000 home and she's giving one of her children, her son, $200,000 to use towards purchasing a real estate property. She's giving her daughter the same amount and her other daughter the same amount. Now they can use that to purchase a property for themselves, or they can use that to purchase an investment property as long as mom does not live in it. The other scenario that I gave you earlier is that mom could sell her big house and buy investment properties that she probably would have managed by a property manager, but the income that she receives from the rentals would help to sustain her life while she's living in a retirement community. Now, eventually mom passes and her three children are inheriting those properties and they're not having to pay the capital gains taxes on those properties upon the mom's death. So here again, it's another option that we really haven't talked to or talked about much this year. But if there's something about that that's interesting to you, maybe you have investment properties already, or you like the idea of how that might work, you more than likely have a financial planner that's working with you or might want a reference to some and your real estate agent to help you with that so that you can make the right purchase that's going to be an income increase for you. Uh, there's more technicality that goes with this. There's a certain number of days that you need to identify the properties and close on the properties, but those are topics that we can talk about together one-on-one -on -one if you have interest. After our seminar today, we can schedule an appointment. I wanted to introduce that to you as a thought process. What I'm finding now is that a lot of people are rethinking how they want their legacy to be. And a lot of it has been based on COVID um, and what's happened there. Our real estate market is changing more to people looking at moving out of town than moving into town. So uh, be sure to ask those questions. So as we get closer to the end of our seminar today, let's look at some strategies that we might wanna consider, five strategies for leaving a legacy. First of all, you wanna understand your situation. So we've given you some experts here today to talk about different uh, options for you to consider. Identify any challenges that you might have, communicate with your family, clarify your goals, Learn about all your options. This is the best time to do that. What's available to me to make those decisions because we're not in a crisis mode. Create a plan to include a timetable and a professional team to help you with that. And then five ways to leave a great legacy beyond the financial part because we've talked about that a lot. Support the people and the causes that are important to you. Reflect and decide what's the most important thing in your life. How do you want to be remembered? Share your blessings with others. People need to hear those things these days. Be a mentor to someone that would like to be able to create a legacy because maybe you've done a good part of that. And of course, pursue your passions because they're infectious. Do those things that you really like. Again, all part of leaving your legacy. As we think about those things, uh, and as a reminder, 
for our seminar series, you know, why choose our team? We're certified senior specialists, senior real estate specialists. Our goal is to respect your needs and timelines. We work with boomers, seniors, children of aging parents and estates. We have been very purposed about having strategic relationships with senior focused vendor partners, two of which have been on our presentation with us today. We like to think that we're offering you a complete solution. Uh, we like to be the hub and help you with the strategic planning so that we can ensure that your transaction is smooth and that it moves well for you and all parties involved. Also connecting you to those partners that we work with to help you further along. This is our team of sponsors. And again, this has been a long year for us. We had planned on doing face-to-face -face seminars at the Viridian. Uh, the Viridian is very excited to, to uh, welcome us back next year. Um, we have uh, the Viridian Elements. We have Davidson Law Group. We have Mutual of Omaha. Old Republic Title helps with our documents. The Watermark at Broadway City View is a very beautiful um, retirement community that is a continuing care retirement community. Dignity Life Well Celebrated, Dignity Memorial with Bertha. She's been a great sponsor. We have dependable packers and movers that have been with us. Lots of our uh, clients have used their services. And I wanna just take a, a brief moment for those people that are on with us today that might want to say something as uh, re representing their company. Debbie, who do we have? Um, I think just Bertha and Matt today. Okay. Well, Bertha, um, let me ask you, is there anything in parting before we go into questions that you'd like to share with our audience regarding dignity? Well, the only thing I'd like to share is that I am available and right now with the COVID, a lot of times people are not comfortable meeting, which is great. Um, we can actually meet virtually. So that is a great tool. You'll be able to see the screen as, we, as we're looking at this screen now. So I'm able to answer any questions, go over things with you. And even if you've already pre-planned and you need someone just to look at what you've already done, just to make sure there are no holes, I'm able to do that as well. So it doesn't cost you anything for information. So please reach out to me. I'd love to be your advocate when it comes to funerals, cremations, and cemetery property. Great, thank you. How about you, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just like with Bertha, we, we also give free consultations. So if any of the stuff that I talked about today, um, you know, popped up, in your mind is something that you you feel like you need to look at or work on or maybe you've done nothing and we need to start from the beginning maybe you've done something you did a long time ago and some things that i said you know your interest um also you know if people pass away um i deal with it on the back end as well and we do those free consultations if you have stuff already documents already i'd be glad to look at those as well and see if they're up to 2020 standards and see if there's any holes in those as well um, so you can, you can get our contact information, yourtexaslegacy.com, um, to, to see all of our offices. We have offices all over um, DFW as well as East Texas. I think you're getting ready to open a new office, aren't you, Matt? We are, right on the border of Keller and South Lake. Oh, that's great. Yep. That's great. That's and great. I have dropped um, Bertha's and Matt's contact information into the chat, and we'll also share that in the follow-up email. Okay, that sounds great. That's perfect. That's perfect. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move forward then. We're now at our question stage. So you've learned a lot today. I hope that you feel like you've learned a lot the last um, uh, eight months together, nine months together, uh, and that you've enjoyed our seminars. Uh, what kind of questions do we have today? Debbie, so do you have any in the chat? Go ahead. I don't think we had anything come up in the chat. So if um, anybody has a question, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Okay. It must have done that good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have.
have a question. I missed, um, have dur durable power of attorney and what's the medical document called? So the actual authority um, decision-making document for medical is a medical power of attorney in Texas. It has a different name in every state, but here it's okay. the medical power of attorney. And then the, the document where you can make your life support decisions ahead of time so that your family members aren't left to make those is called an advanced medical directive. And in okay. other states, it's called a living will. But here it's called an advanced medical directive. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I will say that um, like with Bertha, uh, John and I went and scheduled an appointment with Matt and sat down with him to put together our trust. Uh, that was a great, all that was uh, very educational uh, and very detailed. Uh, so we have, uh, we've got hopefully uh, Patrick Sullivan will feel very lucky that uh, his parents took the time to get all of these things together for him. Um, it was really great. Uh, there have been people that we've worked with uh, that have had the beginnings of their paperwork put together or maybe something that they had 15, 20 years ago. And it's been nice to be able to uh, refer them uh, to the Davidsons to have a look at their documentation. Um, Matt, you are, your, James is in your business with you. And since we don't have another question, do you want to just real briefly share with us how your, you and your brother got into elder law versus general practice? Yeah, sure. So we, we, we did in early on in our career did just have a general practice because when you're a young attorney out on your own, it's hard not to just take anything that comes in the door. But our real passion was for estate planning and elder law because of our own experience with our family. Um, our grandparents, my mom's parents, um, they, they both were in World War II. My grandma served in the CIA in the Pentagon, and then our grandpa was a Marine in the Pacific. They came home from the war, and they uh, went to college, um, started having kids, worked a career um, their whole life, the same way that people used to do, worked the same place their whole life. Uh, and then when it was time to retire, they went ahead and got their estate planning documents done, and they got some good ones done. However, long-term care loomed its ugly head um, 20 or 30 years later, and they did not have a plan for that. So the elder law aspect of our firm really came into play when we saw our grandparents have to spend every penny that they worked their whole life for on long-term care. Um, we were eventually close to the end of their life, able to get some elder care planning done because um, that we, we had just now gotten into that practice area. Um, but that was really what spurred it, is that we saw them, they, they, they had this wonderful, glorious life, and they worked really, really hard to provide for their family, and they ended up not being able to leave a financial legacy because of long-term care. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what really what spurred my brother and I to get into not just traditional estate planning, which they had, but also to get into the elder law aspect to help to protect their assets from long-term care. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Absolutely. As we prepare now to go ahead and move forward uh, in our seminar, we're kind of ending a little bit early today. Um, Debbie is going to go ahead and prepare for our drawings. And what I would like to share is uh, that we're going to be coming back, as I had mentioned uh, previously, to the Viridian next year, uh, 2021, uh, in their beautiful event center. Our uh, seminar series is going to start in February. I think last year we started in March, but we're going to start in February. And for February and March, uh, jot this down, our seminars will be the first Thursday for February and March. And then April through November, it will be on the second Thursday. And we really like Thursdays. They seem to work well for us. And the time of between two and four seems to work well. So that's what we're planning on. We've got some new topics that we're putting together now, but two uh, that we are going to be, uh, we will have a, on our list. Uh, one is going to be, be smart about going from we to me. And if you think about that, yourself or your friends, I hear often with uh, people that we've been working with, I have a couple right now where she was, her husband handled everything, all the repairs, all the bills, all the everything. She didn't really have to handle anything. 
And now her husband uh, has uh, been diagnosed with dementia and it really seems to have escalated. And now she is in charge of taking care of everything. And it's really been difficult. Um, and when there's you know, more and more of those types of things that um, come to play in our lives as we work with older adults. So one of them will be be smart about going from we to me. And then another one is be smart about living to 100. You know, we're living longer than our parents did or our grandparents did. And how are we positioned for that? And hopefully some of the things that we talked about today will help you uh, get in a position for that. We're going to be talking tech next year. Um, a lot of people have asked us about that. And we're also going to be uh, talking more about the 1031 exchange uh, legacy plan that we talked about today. So there'll be a lot out there for you. New topics. We'll still have some of the ones that we've presented in the past that are um, popular ones that people always ask to come back to. And I want to uh, take this time to uh, wish you all a wonderful holiday. Uh, and, and, you know, and it, it sounds awkward to say that because it's going to be so different. But I want it to be uh, nice for you in the best way that you can do that. And um, I want you to know that we want to be, uh, we want to be, we're here for you. If you have uh, things, questions or ideas that you want to run by us or you're looking for a resource to help you, please make your first call ours so that we can, um, we can be kind and help you out with that. Um, I know that uh, my team, uh, Debbie and I, Patrick and John, and the rest of the individuals that have been a part of this with us uh, really uh, feel blessed to have been able to share with you this year.